Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. We have a great episode for you today. We are talking about sanctuary to contested domain, national security space policy. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you to find us on Twitter at hashtag the Space Policy Show. Ask your questions on Vimeo in the dialog box. And you can also sign up for our latest news alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. It's very easy and you'll get the latest to your inbox. Our host today is Robin Dickey. She's an associate member of the technical staff at the Aerospace Corporation's Center for Space Policy and Strategy. She focuses on space policy and strategy issues related to national security, geopolitics, and international relations. Her experience prior to aerospace includes risk analysis, legislative affairs, and international development. She earned both her bachelor's and master's degrees in international studies at Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University. Excuse me. Our guests today, we have Robert Bell. He has a 45-year government career that includes seven years as the U.S. Defense Advisor at NATO, three years as a NATO Assistant Secretary General for Defense Investment, seven years at the White House as President Clinton's National Security Council, Senior Director for Defense Policy and Arms Control, 18 years on the staffs of the Senate Foreign Relations and Armed Services Committee and the Congressional Research Service, six years as an Air Force officer. And from 2003 to 2010, he served as Senior Vice President at SAIC, directing business development activities in Europe. Mr. Bell has a Bachelor of Science in International Affairs from the U.S. Air Force Academy and a Master of Arts in International Security Studies from Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He is currently a fourth-year Ph.D. candidate at Fletcher and a distinguished professor of the practice at Georgia Tech. Our next guest is General Lance Lord. General Lance Lord retired in 2006 as Commander Air Force Space Command upon completion of 37 years of active service. General Lord was a key, a key leader in shaping Air Force space operations within the evolving parameters of U.S. national space policy. Since retirement, he has been active in several space businesses and ventures. Over to you, Robin, to get us started. Thanks, Rebecca. Sanctuary has become a very popular word in the space policy community with many officials and experts using some version of the phrase, space is no longer a sanctuary, to argue that US satellites are vulnerable and that more should be done to protect them. I recently published a paper titled, The Rise and Fall of Space Sanctuary in US Policy. That explored the history between the, these statements. So I'm so excited to have with me two guests with experience in space policy spanning numerous administrations. Today, we're gonna to dive deeper into the history of national security space policy, whether it treated space as a sanctuary or as a contested domain, and what that means for policy today and looking towards the future. Thank you both so much for being here, and I'm gonna dive right in with my first question. Could you each please describe your experiences with space policy in your career? And this includes the organizations you worked for, was your main focus on space or as part of a larger portfolio? And what specific space issues did you maybe focus the most on? General Lord, why don't you start? Answer that question from my perspective. Uh, although I was commissioned in the Air Force in 1968, uh, uh, I didn't really get involved in the space business till uh, 1979 to 82. I was assigned as a young major in the, in the Pentagon working for the Office of Net Assessment for uh, Andrew Marshall, where our job was to do comparative analysis uh, to uh, yield insights for the Secretary of Defense on uh, comparing U.S. and uh, uh, opponent kinds of capabilities. So space was one of the first things we took a look at, and certainly in the, uh, uh, the final days of uh, uh, Secretary Harold Brown as the Secretary of Defense, and then moving to Casper Weinberger with the early days of the Reagan administration and the formation of uh, the High Frontier uh, document by Dana Graham and uh, the beginnings of uh, uh, the Air Force Space Command being established as a command uh, uh, and a separate command in the United States Air Force Major Command uh, in 1982, the importance of space. And I, and I would ar argue that uh, space policy was uh, still in its formative phases, although uh, you can go back to Sputnik and uh, what happened with uh, 
uh, as a result of uh, you know General Schrieber's efforts to continue to promote space, and then uh, in the early days of the uh, Kennedy administration with uh, Yuri Gagarin, the uh, cosmonaut, uh, and uh, the U.S.'s uh, emphasis on going to the moon in the, in the early 1960s and 1961. Uh, those were all things that were uh, uh, seminal events, if you will, and kind of pointed the direction about how important space would be in the future and space policy had to evolve as, uh, uh, as we move forward. Then on to the creation of Air Force Space Command, 1982, and then uh, as space became uh, uh, recognized as a uh, vital enabler for all uh, joint forces, uh, and the importance that uh, that played in uh, U.S. military operations uh, was really, uh, uh, really highlighted with space capabilities. So space became uh, uh, competitive, congested, and contested, and space policy had to evolve to make sure that uh, the goals and objectives and the resources needed to uh, uh, provide uh, the capability to operate and maintain safe and secure those capabilities in, in the environment of space uh, really uh, assumed a greater importance. And I've always viewed uh, space policy as an enabler, uh, uh, not as a constraint to what we were, uh, uh, what we were doing. Um, important, uh, really highlighted the importance of space. Awesome, thank you. On to you, Mr. Well, I would say, Robin, that uh, space was a rather constant focus throughout my professional career. It really began for me as a captain in the Air Force when I commanded uh, a squadron at Saunders Farm Air Base in Greenland and uh, had a detachment up at Thule. And I knew that BMUS was up at Thule, but until I took command of that unit and traveled up there, I didn't really realize the extent to which we use Thule for uh, Air Force Command facilities that control satellites. Um, that, that was a real eye-opener to me. Um, later, when I went to work on the Senate Armed Services Committee for the chairman, Senator Sam Brown of Georgia, now retired, I was plunged during the Reagan era, of course, into SDI and ASAT and those uh, great, huge, often contentious debates in Congress between the arms control community and the military modernization, if you will, uh, community. Uh, then at the White House, working for President Clinton for seven years as his senior National Security Council Director for Defense and Arms Control, um, I saw it from that other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, trying to strike that balance between our objectives in arms control and our requirements in terms of national defense and military uh, readiness. Um, then that, that job included aspects of space that um, I hadn't anticipated, like representing the president on the interagency committee that determined what was the future of GPS, who was going to pay for it, what capabilities, whether to let civil sector have access to it, all these great policy questions. Uh, and that then took me to NATO, uh, where I was Assistant Secretary General, and immediately got thrown into a big battle between the United States and France about the European Union's Galileo satellite navigation system and whether they were going to, in effect, try to block the encode. <laughs> so uh, as a hold us hostage in case uh, we ever thought we would turn GPS off. And then at the very end of my career, the policy decision at NATO just two years ago to uh, to declare space as an operational domain for alliance operations. And that brings me back to something that General Lord said earlier about space policy being more of an enabler than a constraint or an impediment. And so I wanted to ask you both about your impression of space policy and the, the impressions that others had at the time that you were working there. And so do you think that the general impression of space policy was that there needed to be significant change made to move it along or that the effort should be more on gradually improving on what you had already? in the context of it being either an enabler or a constraint on what you saw being the most important space activities. General Lord? Well, I think uh, I always looked at, uh, you know, Robin, I always looked at space uh, policy to be an enabler to what we were doing and uh, how we could operate uh, 
and and sometimes uh, I might have thought that things weren't uh, were a little more too pres prescriptive as they needed to be with respect to uh, the priorities that uh, I wanted to put on the space uh, systems because uh, when you take when you talk about operating in the environment of space uh, space control uh, uh, the three elements of space control space domain awareness used to be space situation awareness but understanding who's operating in the environment as well as uh, uh, defensive uh, uh, counter space, uh, the capability to defend your assets, and then uh, offensive counter space if you need to uh, uh, do something to thwart an enemy's uh, actions or a potential competitor. Uh, those uh, seem to fall in line. Uh, our our policies uh, changed uh, uh, to uh, to meet those kind of needs. Uh, go all the way back to uh, a couple of seminal events in in the whole world uh, with respect to. Uh, uh, President Eisenhower and uh, General Benny Schriever, uh, uh, Sputnik uh, uh, situation uh, really required us to think a little more differently about uh, uh, space and the international norms that operate. And then uh, also with uh, uh, in President Kennedy's administration with uh, the flight of uh, uh, Yuri uh, Gregarian, uh, a Russian uh, uh, astronaut and uh, or cosmonaut uh, is probably more appropriate to say, but. Uh, uh, and then uh, the charge to uh, uh, go to the moon, uh, not because it's easy, but because it's hard and difficult. Uh, and and the policy, the goals, and the resources to uh, follow those, uh, uh, I think, kept pace with uh, uh, the importance that uh, space was becoming. And, and, and now, especially with respect to uh, a contested and congested and competitive environment, it's important uh, that I think that uh, space policy does not hinder our uh, operations. It guides us and provides the enablers for us to be able to uh, operate uh, with due regard in space and take care of our assets and then challenge those who would challenge us in the environment. Yeah, I would say, Robin and General Lord, that um, two aspects of space policy have remained very uh, constant, I think, through, through the decades of my career. One changed dramatically, so let me just outline that. Uh, the two that I think have been constant is, first, uh, there's been the reality of ASAT capability in so many different ways, whether it's uh, kinetic, whether it's uh, using ICBMs or SM3s or missiles launched off an F-15, whether it's uh, a laser uh constant efforts over decades to uh, explore capabilities um, that are real and that um, are needed to deter an adversary's temptation to use ASAP. Uh, the other constant, I think, has been sort of a national interest in uh, the denuclearization, if I can put it that way, of space. Uh, of seeing space uh, as a element of arms control, both in terms of trying to keep nuclear weapons out of space. Uh, the Outer Space Treaty in 1967 is still in effect, of course. And uh, beyond that, a, a sort of a principle that national technical means of verification are critical to arms control and nuclear reduction. So you had Stark treaties and ABM treaties that tried to protect the sanctity of the NTM as it was space-based. Uh, the one element that changed radically, of course, was President Reagan's Star Wars proposal. Uh, that came in um, quite extraordinarily in 1983. Uh, I was with Senator Nunn watching a um, speech on TV, and we just had a hearing the week before where the services had all said they had exactly what they needed for <laughs> ballistic missile defense purposes, and then this incredible speech that thrust us into a debate about weapons in space, kinetic weapons, brilliant pebbles, uh, particularly. And that um, that really roiled the waters, if you will, in Congress and gave uh, impetus to those that wanted to um, try to make space sanctuary broader than just a nuclear-free zone, but, but a de-weaponization of space totally. And that then spilled over into ASAP arms control efforts that consumed us for a long time in that era. Now, they, you know, to the extent that we have a national missile defense now that's based on land-based kinetic kill, 
50 kilo interceptors, uh, things have quieted down. But the R&D programs for more advanced and alternative means for the BMD mission still go forward. So it could, it could conceivably come back in a future administration if there was the, uh, the technological breakthrough that we've yet to, um, to realize in that respect. And that raises some of the elements that I discuss in the paper about the need to balance between different actors. As you both know, the U.S. government is extremely complicated, and there's so many different actors who have different institutions that they represent within the government, different priorities, different tools, different motivations, and that can lead to different kinds of pressures on policy, in this case, space policy. So I know, Mr. Bell, you referenced uh, the conflict between Congress and the Reagan administration over SDI in the 1980s. Do either of you have any other examples of cases when different perspectives on what the best U.S. space policy might be came from different uh, actors? Let me, uh, uh, yeah, I think that um, in any administration, uh, as you go through the interagency process, it's not at all the case that each agency comes to the table with the same mindset. Uh, I have not worked in the Trump administration, so I cannot speak to that. But historically, um, there is at least nuances between defense and state. Uh, in the Clinton era, we still had the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, which uh, wanted to be th- very forward-leading in terms of pushing the space as sanctuary perspective. And even when we did the space policy review that culminated in 1996, <clears throat> the, the decision was taken uh, by the president to let the Office of Technology and Science Policy Council, which was sort of a parallel universe at the White House to the National Security Council, have the lead in that review. And unfortunately, uh, uh, that council uh, deferred a bit to the National Security Council in terms of the input when it came to uh, military and weapons issues. But we had to deal with not only uh, differences of view coming from Capitol Hill from people that really wanted to push space arms control much harder than we thought was prudent, but we needed to find consensus if possible within the interagency to take a unified recommendation to the president. Awesome, thank you, uh, General Lord. Uh, Robin, let me uh, let me take that uh, in a little different direction, but uh, certainly to deal with the, the basis of your question. What we did in Air Force Space Command uh, when I was a vice commander then carried on to uh, uh, my time as commander was uh, to make sure that we were cooperating in that environment and we, we got everybody's uh, wishes and abilities on the table. Uh, uh, we created a, a quarterly meeting between uh, uh, the commander of US Space Command, uh, the director of uh, uh, NASA, as well as uh, the director of the National Reconnaissance Office, so that we could make sure that uh, we're able to coordinate uh, who's, uh, you know, operational capabilities and uh, and work together to make sure that uh, if there were capabilities that one needed that the other could provide, uh, et cetera, that we were all uh, linked together. Because just as you said, it's a complex process and priorities could be different, but the what I really liked about space policy was setting the goals uh, for how we're operating in the domain of space and then being able to provide the resources and the direction for the government to operate within those uh, uh, constraints, if you will, or within that policy uh, really came in loud and clear in my mind. So that brings me to the kind of money question in the paper, and that's about the policy of of space as either being a sanctuary or a contested domain. And uh, General Lord, you mentioned your time with, uh, or your knowledge of Bernard Schriever, an amazing general um, that was very influential on policy and on operations, especially in the 1950s and 1960s. And so one thing that I noticed 
from General Schriever as well as other Air Force generals was that although the time from 1957 and the launch of Sputnik to the mid 1970s, when uh, the change to more of an overall contested policy, there was a bit of a, a difference between the senior level, you know, Eisenhower administration and its successors perspective that chose that sanctuary policy. Whereas from the service level, uh, leaders like General Schriever, there was much more interest in perhaps treating space as a high ground at dealing with some of the different operational challenges they saw coming up in space. And so some of this nuance that I found was very interesting. When um, Even when I would categorize something as a sanctuary policy or as a contested policy, you still saw some, some difference in what different activities were taken and so the, what I want to ask the both of you is, did you see any specific time when you really believed that the policy you were acting under was either a sanctuary or as treating space as a contested domain? And did you see that change over time, either through the actions that people were taking or from the top level kind of policy documents you were asked to follow? And as part of that, first, I'd like to ask you, what does sanctuary mean to you? Uh, that's a really good question, Ronald, because I think it hits to the issue, uh, really to the heart of the issue with respect to, uh, you know, how we're able to operate in, uh, and work in the domain of space. Because really, it's not only do we operate in space, but it's the goods and services we derive from space, which really drive the economic engine and the, and the uh, national policies and the, and the capability. It's a fundamental strength of the United States. And we want to make sure that we maintain that. But I think uh, if we think back to uh, 1957 and Sputnik uh, and what happened with uh, General Schriever and talking about uh, uh, space superiority back then, I mean, he was the first person to really uh, uh, speak about that. Uh, uh, there was a hope back then, I think, that uh, we wouldn't uh, get too far out in front of our international competitors to uh, uh, you know, to be more, uh, to be operate within, uh, you know, international norms, if you will. And I think there was a, there was a desire to treat that as an area that we didn't really want to, uh, uh, tread too, uh, uh, too heavily into, but, uh, uh, technology being what it is and the military advantages that are capable, uh, and, uh, the willingness to, uh, uh, continue to pursue operating both, uh, from the civil side to the military side, as well as now in the commercial areas in space, uh, it really raised uh, uh, the importance of the environment. So I don't think uh, uh, you can you can really call space a sanctuary. I think it uh, is really a contested environment, but it's 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 also competitive, and uh, it's congested. So internationally, uh, the, under the rules, uh, if you uh, uh, if you launch a spacecraft into space, then you're responsible for uh, you know taking care of it as it. Uh, ends its life and uh, put it in the space graveyard or make sure that it uh, destroys itself on re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, all those things, and uh, you're responsible for uh, uh, any kind of damage that might occur. So uh, in that sense, uh, there's still an international cooperation and will be continue to be as uh, the environment gets more crowded and uh, more contested. So I think the space policy uh, uh, has really uh, evolved to uh, meet the needs of the United States and uh, and to be able to continue to do the missions in space that are important. So I think um, it's there are elements of both that uh, you can find um, historically in any administration. And the question is, um, what's the balance between them? Uh, Robin, you used Absolutely. the word uh, dominant. <laughs> and, I think there has been uh, a shift of emphasis, certainly if you go back, as you did to the early days, uh, the Eisenhower administration. But, you know, at that time, we were doing some pretty extraordinary things. There was a, a test, a atomic test in 1957 called Art Tech T, where we set off about a four megaton hydrogen bomb in space at, at least at 250,000 feet, which is pretty hot, right over Johnston Atoll. Um, that got a lot of attention. People were having parties to go watch these uh, explosions way above their heads. But it gave impetus to um, 
to the Outer Space Treaty. So well, my perspective has always been that sanctuary, in effect, means uh, an effort to keep space denuclearized, in effect, to make space a nuclear-free zone. Um, it's important to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time for any administration. But uh, in the Clinton administration, uh, we had to get the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty extended indefinitely and without amendment. Uh, and that includes Article 6 of the NPT, which permits us to seek as an ultimate goal nuclear disarmament. So it was very important for certain constituencies, certain allies and partners, uh, the rest of the world, nations, and the uh, developing world that, that we show uh, that we cared about arms control and that we were pushing a, a denuclearization agenda. Uh, that included uh, signing a lot of nuclear free zone treaties, uh, South Africa, the South Pacific, uh, just to name two. And sort of in that context, uh, it would not have been to our advantage to have suggested that we're having nuclear weapons since in space uh, was a good idea. Uh, we violated the treaty, among other things. And um, I think the, the ASAP debate on the arms control side sort of got caught up in some of that spirit. As I said, it was a reaction to Brilliant Pebbles, a non-nuclear kinetic orbiting uh, weapon system that was proposed. So, uh, but while you're doing that, while you are talking uh, a particular policy line that you need to talk for arms control national objectives, uh, you also have to tend to the national defense and be prudent. And in that sense, the Clinton administration certainly, um, as you quote me in your article, towards um, viewed space as contested, and we were quite clear that we had to have space control capabilities. Um, under Under Secretary of Defense John Hamry, I think we uh, our eyes were opened a bit to the debris problem and sort of the trade-offs between kinetic approaches and something maybe using cyber or electro-optical blinding or lasers or whatever. But um, still, we were quite clear that we had to maintain that control. So... Uh, it's tempting to to try to reduce things to is it one or the other, but sometimes you you have to do both. You know, the Obama administration, uh, the president of the United States went to Prague and gave a speech saying he wanted to operationalize the effort to create the conditions for nuclear disarmament. Uh, at the same time, uh, we were agreeing that we would need to spend somewhere between $1.2 and $1.6 trillion to modernize the triad. So sometimes you just have to do both and hope that the balance between the two is credible. Absolutely. Yeah, that very much matches up with what I found in the research of it, although I have a contested sanctuary space dichotomy, it's not a mutually exclusive, clear cut division. And there are times when you can see one take the lead, both be prevalent. Um, and, and so it's really that case of, of balance or, or priority among them. And you actually read my mind, Mr. Bell, because one of my next questions was going to be about kind of around the Clinton and the George W. Bush administration years, looking at that kind of the nuance within contested space and space control of an increasing emphasis on temporary and reversible means of um, dealing with contested space. So I wonder if, uh, General Lord, if you'd like to also talk about that and talk about where that, that shift came from and whether that was something you saw reflected in the policy or whether that was more of a nuance under the same uh, policy umbrella. No, I, I don't think it was, uh, uh, you know, it was constrained. It certainly wasn't a nuance. It was, a, you know, a definite uh, move by, uh, uh, for an operational purpose. I mean, what, what we've done is essentially taken the military competition and moved it from, uh, uh, these are words that Andy Marshall used to use in the an assessment about the U.S. and, back then, U.S. and Russian uh, military competition. We've taken the, the space competition and really moved it to, uh, Beyond a little further than, uh, and, uh, really, uh, uh, with all the players in space. I mean, you don't have to be a, uh, 
a spacefaring nation that has space gate goes. I mean, you can, uh, you can lease, you can rent, you can uh, partner, you can be part of another uh, space uh, operation and certainly get, uh, uh, you know, space-based capabilities uh, uh, out of uh, uh, another satellite that you rent or at least a transponder or whatever. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, the space uh, symposium's uh, estimate about how much is spent worldwide on uh, space, it's over, you know, 400 to uh, 150 billion dollars a year, and only, only 10 or 15 percent of that are satellites and uh, launch vehicles, the rest are in the exploitation of space goods and services, so, uh, you know, command and control, GPS, all the things that come from, uh, the good things that come from space, so really, uh, uh, we move the competition to an environment that, uh, uh, you know, is uh, certainly is, uh, I think, prosperous because uh, of the capability to work and understanding what's going on in the environment. But then that puts the, the emphasis, uh, certainly the emphasis on defense to make sure they understand exactly what uh, is in that environment, who's doing what, how they're operating, what the indicators might be. The hardest problem to really... Uh, Work within the overall constraints of U.S. policy certainly is, uh, you know, attribution. If something happens to a satellite uh, or a downlink or uh, some capability, you have to decide, you know, where did it come from? Is that a benign, uh, uh, or a single bit upset in the onboard processor, or is it somebody trying to do something to uh, stop your space-based capabilities? So, uh, I mean, those will continue to be uh, a big problem, certainly within uh, the constraints. And as policy evolved, to get from, uh, uh, you know, to a contested, competitive, and uh, uh, certainly a uh, really a, uh, congested environment <laughs> that we're seeing now, and we'll see more of in the future, uh, I think the space policy uh, framework uh, worked fine. And, uh, you know, I didn't have a problem with, uh, with any of the other statements that evolved to meet the uh, realities of what was going on in the environment, in my view. And Mr. Bell, anything else to add on that kind of uh, the temporary reversible shift in the focus? Um, did you see that as much on the NSC side as well? You, you mentioned it with, with John Hamry. Well, I think, you know, we were wrestling with the reality of how crowded space has become, how much is up there, how much space junk is up there, and what the consequences uh, to our own vital space interest would be um, if we had the ESAP program based on kinetic fuel. Uh, so... To me, it was just a common sense to, to try to examine, particularly as more and more opportunities presented themselves with uh, cyber or uh, jamming or lasers to um, find alternative ways to make sure we could exercise space control. Mm -hmm. you know, people have to reduce things sometimes to, to try to score points. and. Uh, Take a, and you have constituencies behind different programs. So when when we reduced funding in the Clinton administration for the Army's kinetic fuel ASAP, mm -hmm. there was immediate criticism that we were naively of the view that uh, you could achieve sanctuaries in space. Uh, no, we were simply trying to be smart in how we tailored our ASAP efforts to fit our own national requirements. Absolutely. Thank you. So I have one last kind of historical point for discussion, <laughs> and that's looking at some of the major events that caught a lot of attention and discussion. And um, I, I structured my paper off of the, the four events, um, the, the launch of Sputnik in 1957, the mid-1970s Soviet co-orbital ASAT tests that triggered a lot of increased attention to American ASAT programs, and then uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, but in many ways, more importantly, the Gulf War in 1991 as demonstrating U.S. space capabilities and the reliance that we had on them and still have today. And then finally, the, the 2007 Chinese ASAT test, um, which, of course, has 
played a major role in, in public discussions today. So I was wondering if, if each of you could speak to what you see as being kind of the, the role of these big kind of publicly discussed events on space policy and, and space activities. Did you see them as triggering any changes or were they perhaps new ways to highlight older arguments um, or just ways to kind of keep the, the conversation fresh and, and current? Uh, General Lord, let's start with you. Uh, let me deal with uh, the last one first, uh, what you raised in the uh, Chinese uh, ASAT test. Uh, I was in in China in probably 2000, and, uh, I think, 9 or 10, and talking to uh, uh, and, and some of the East West Institute, uh, track two discussions uh, with, uh, with some of the Chinese, our Chinese counterparts. And uh, to me, at least my impression was. Uh, uh, from the people I talked with, that there was a, there was a profound misunderstanding or not complete understanding about what could happen with the debris created in uh, in the Earth orbit, uh, uh, as it was as a result of that uh, uh, of that uh, test, if you will. It may have been appreciated at a higher levels in the government. I'm not sure, but uh, the people I was talking to were, uh, were I think, totally uh, not totally, but uh, perhaps uninformed about the, the, the total effects of what, what could happen. To me, that raised a significant issue with respect to uh, uh, how uh, U.S. forces would operate in the domain of uh, space and how important it is to uh, understand, as uh, Robert mentioned earlier, and I think it's a uh, continued concern, how you deal with the space debris and what the, uh, what the future holds for uh, you see all these mega constellations in the North Urban and all the things that have been subscribed to and approved. Uh, we're talking 20,000 in many cases uh, more, uh, uh, you know, satellites in, in the North Urban for, uh, you know, communications capability, et cetera. But long story short, understanding uh, that environment, uh, that really raised concern about how important it is to have space domain awareness and how that uh, impacts uh, how we intend to operate in the future and be able to leverage the capabilities that uh, uh, understand uh, we, we depend on and certainly the U.S. economy and, and, and for a lot of the other countries in the world, certainly their economies as well, are enabled by space-based uh, capabilities. Can't take that for granted that uh, we've got to be able to operate and uh, continue to have a clear clear way to operate in the future. And, and in my mind, the space policy is... Uh, has evolved with uh, the understanding of, uh, you know, just how large uh, the environment is and what, uh, what's going on and what needs to be done operationally in, in that environment. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Yeah, so Robin, I think your, your four uh, data points across the years are just right. Uh, I think they were definitely pivot points for uh, national policy. Um, there was a, a famous British diplomat who was once asked, well, what, what, was, what are the main factors that, that determine British foreign policy? And his answer was, events, my boy, events. <laughs> and so there's something unassailably real about an event like a Sputnik launch. So it had a tremendous effect in the United States in so many strategic terms that led to Eisenhower accelerating ICBM programs, uh, doubts about the survivability of, of bomber bases, uh, led Eisenhower to offer intermediate range nuclear missiles to all our European allies if they wanted to join us. Um, these events uh, sort of remove all ambiguity in terms of the intelligence estimate of, of what you're dealing with. A good example was uh, the first launch by North Korea of a three-stage uh, ballistic missile that probably failed to put a satellite in orbit. But once uh, we confirmed the test, there was no blinking the fact that China now had the capability to get a payload to Los Angeles from uh, its part of the world, and it fundamentally altered the Clinton administration's approach on national missile defense. And the president concluded we had to we had to build a national missile defense. The intelligence estimates that we still had 15 years 
uh, before we needed to worry about that was sort of blown away. Um, we'll see what events coming up have equal power to the four that, that you outlined in your excellent report, Robin. I, I sort of wonder whether um, this year's return by the United States to space using our own assets and uh, the SpaceX and the sort of the commercialization of space travel um, is going to be a, that kind of pivot point event where Americans start thinking about space as someplace they themselves might go. Uh, it's good that uh, DOD and uh, NASA just uh, and the space sports have just signed a new MOU and we have to define that partnership between civil, peaceful purposes in space and our space control requirements. But uh, the success of the SpaceX mission up to the space station, I think, uh, revived an American uh, deep interest in space that maybe has been somewhat lagging since the uh, Challenger disaster. Absolutely. I mean, speaking to the, the power of events is, is definitely interesting, especially with in space, there's never been any shots fired in, in anger. So the, the ultimate space event that would affect this contested versus sanctuary balance is something that we yet to have really experienced. And so that means that all, all of the policy that we have, all the, the decisions and plans we can make, there's there's still going to be a level of uncertainty until or if, you know, hopefully it never happens. But if such thing happens, that could really have a big impact. And turning to what Mr. Bell said about um, potential current pivot points, that brings me to kind of my, my final question of the discussion. We've had an amazing look back through all these different elements of history and policy. And I wanted to give you both a chance to discuss what you think um, the biggest lessons from this history are for space policy today and how it might shape looking forward to the future, what what could happen. Um, General Lord, if you have any uh, additional points on what could be pivotal events in the future, um, why don't we start with you, General Lord? We'll have to fit within uh, you know, how we view our space policy, and the policy is going to have to evolve as well as we uh, uh, look further into uh, you know, what's, what's defense's role in protecting uh, uh, commercial capabilities as, as they go beyond the moon and beyond and uh, uh, the use of reusable uh, uh, you know, space rockets, etc. all the things that go into uh, uh, creating space-based capabilities. So, uh, you know, uh, we have to protect and defend uh, what is in our national interest and policy, in my mind, has always evolved to uh, help us do that. It may not be as uh, as prescriptive as some would like. It may be uh, too broad or not broad enough in certain areas. So we just have to work those and probe together to, to make that happen. So uh, I personally think that, uh, you know, we, we've emerged as a nation and certainly with uh, our space-based capabilities in a great way because we've worked uh, hand-in-hand together with uh, uh, the policy aspects of it. We have a different view, but uh, I've never felt constrained by uh, uh, to do things operationally that were in the best interest of us as a space spacefaring nation that were violating space policy. Thanks to Robert and his team for what they did to help shape that. Absolutely. Well, Robin, I, I'm tempted to say I think the biggest challenge we face uh, going forward is uh, figuring out whether the Space Force officers are going to wear Air Force or Navy uniforms and whether they're going to have Air Force or Navy ranks. But setting that aside, uh, I really do think, uh, not just in terms of space policy, but in terms of national defense uh, and its interrelationship with arms control generally, uh, the biggest challenge we face is trying to restore a sense of bipartisanship you know, between our two political parties as they need to, to come together on, on complex national defense issues like space policy. Uh, I had the great privilege of working on Capitol Hill 
back in an era of bipartisanship for a chairman who, who routinely reached across the aisle to put together bipartisan consensus behind important initiatives. Of course, Senator Nunn was probably the gold standard on that, but I worked on the Republican staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and uh, at that time, uh, it still had an integrated staff, not split Republican and Democrat staff, but an integrated staff. Uh, the good news here is that the, the Senate Armed Services Committee is probably the last holdout uh, up there in terms of getting its legislation through and being uh, successful at this, uh, to at least to a degree. But we need more because space is a very complex issue. Absolutely. Uh, well, yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. Don't mind, Robert, real quick. Uh, I, I agree with you. And I, I met with uh, Sam Dunn on a couple of occasions and talked about uh, uh, what we're doing and uh, with others on the Hill. And what, what really impressed me most was that the members wanted to, along with the staffers, to really understand what the capabilities were that we were employing in the state so that they could just frame the, uh, the issues in the right kind of way where they really with a more full understanding of what the, you know, what the, what space, uh, uh, domain awareness meant, what, uh, space, uh, offensive and defensive counter space capabilities meant and what they were and how they could be employed and how and would it inform them. So, well, whatever you did to energize that, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you both so much for being virtually here to talk with me today. Uh, I had a really excellent time with this discussion. I think we touched on a, a wide range of, of issues that are very important today, uh, as well as throughout their history. So, uh, Mr. Robert Bell, General Lance Lord, thank you again so much. My privilege, Robin. Good to be with you, General Lord, and. Uh... You two both stay safe now. Stay here. Thank you. You as well. All right. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Robin, Robert, and General Lord. We are really appreciative to have you here today. Um, as always, you can find us on Twitter at hashtag the Space Policy Show, or you can ask your questions on Vimeo using the video dialog box. Also, I want to mention the Aerospace Corporation's created a series of discussion papers. I believe I mentioned it in previous episodes. This set of papers is called Space Agenda 2021, and they are on topics that are already at the forefront or likely to emerge in the next few years. In addition to highlighting these issues, the series offers a concise background analyses and options to aid the government, decision makers, industry leaders, journalists, students, and other parties interested in the future of U.S. space efforts. And until next time, take care. Thank you.